Hello class, welcome back. Today we want to talk about God's work of providence. Last time we talked about God's work of creation. This lecture we're going to talk about God's work of providence. Uh, we need to understand providence as preservation. Uh, preservation is God maintaining his creation in existence. This is what Erickson says. Preservation is God maintaining his creation in existence. Uh, there are numerous biblical passages that talk about God's work of preservation, Nehemiah 9.6, Colossians 1.17, Hebrews 1.3, Psalm 104, Matthew 6.26, and Matthew 6.30-33, and Matthew 10.28-32 are key passages. Uh, what are the theological dimensions of preservation? Well, God's children are inseparable from his love and protection. We see this in John 10. We see this in Romans 8. God's children are inseparable from his love and protection. And so his, uh, his work of preservation extends down to the individual human being. That, but that also means that we are not spared from trials and hardships and difficulties, but preserved in the midst of them. Paul talks about this in Philippians 4, 11 through 19. When somebody quotes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you need to remember that that verse in context, Paul is talking about suffering, imprisonment, and loss of everything for the sake of the gospel. He's not talking about weightlifting or winning a soccer game or whatever. He's talking about persevering in the midst of great trial and hardship. We're reminded by this that God is not an absentee landlord. The deist envisionment of God is of, of one who created everything and then stepped out of the way and just watches it run and does nothing else. That is not the God of the Bible. God is not an absentee landlord. God also is not a heavenly repairman. He's not there to fix everything that we break. But he is there to preserve his creation to its ultimate goal. And so the, the idea of God's preserving work feeds and fuels the believer's confidence, gives us strength, it gives us hope that things will turn out the way they're supposed to. And we just need to trust God and follow his leadership. And we're reminded in scripture of the regularity of the created world. We're reminded of this after the great flood. Uh, Genesis tells us that, that seed time and harvest, summer and winter, these, these seasons will not pass from the earth. The earth has its regular created cycles, and we need to remember that. And these are established by God. We need to also think of providence as a kind of government. It is God's governing the world and creation uh, to its proper end. The extent of God's governing activity is that God is active in the universe uh, so that all its events fulfill his plan for it. This is what Erickson says. God is active in the universe so that all its events fulfill his plan for it. Uh, to that end, we need to remember that God's purposeful direction uh, is to steer creation to the ends for which he has designed it, which is his glory. We are reminded in providence that God controls nature. The Bible tells us that God is in control of storms, that God sometimes uses natural disasters as tools of judgment. God is in control of these things. He is in control over the human history and the destiny of nations. So nations rise and nations fall according to God's will and God's plan. God exerts control over the circumstances of individual lives. Uh, God's control over the so-called accidents of life are also talked about in a number of places. Right down to the use of the casting of, of lots. Uh, God's providential control then is all-encompassing. Every aspect of creation falls under God's providential control. Right down to the subatomic level. And that, that's an interesting area of investigation too. Some are looking at the relationship between divine providence and quantum physics. It's another interesting area of exploration. Uh, what about the relationship between God's governing activity and sin, the problem of evil? 
And we'll, we'll talk more specifically about the problem of evil later. But let's talk about sin. First of all, James 1.14 tells us that God is not the author of sin and God cannot cause sin. We are reminded, though, that God can prevent sin. We have numerous instances of this in the Bible. Uh, most notably that, that comes to my mind in Genesis. Uh, Abimelech takes uh, Abraham's wife Sarah into his harem because Abraham was dishonest and said she's my sister, which was partially true. But he, she was also his wife. She was his half-sister and his wife. And God says to Abimelech, I kept you from coming near her and sinning. God prevented that. God can prevent sin. Sometimes God does not prevent sin. Sometimes he allows it. And God can direct sin for a good outcome. We mentioned the other day the crucifixion of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, Peter makes it clear that the crucifixion of Christ was the ultimate act of evil uh, ever uh, committed on the earth that the Jewish leaders and Judas and Pilate were all uh, completely guilty in what they did, and yet this was God's purpose all along for our redemption. And so God can direct sin for a good outcome. And God can limit sin. We see this in the book of Job. God can limit sin. The major features and implications of God's governing activity are as follows. God's governing activity is universal. God's governing activity extends beyond his own people. God is good in his government. Now, it may not seem good to us at the moment, but in the ultimate reality, in the ultimate scheme of things, everything God does is good. God is personally concerned about his own people. Our activity and God's are not mutually exclusive. Sometimes our activity is God's activity through us, in us, to accomplish his will. God is sovereign in his government. That is, as uh, students used to say in a school where I taught, uh, God is God all by himself. Uh, he doesn't have to consult with anybody about what he does. And we need to exercise care in identifying what is God's providence. So how does the doctrine of providence play into the idea of prayer? How does prayer relate to providence if God has predetermined all things? Well, the Bible teaches that God has determined the course of all things. That is certainly true. The Bible also teaches that we are to pray and that prayer has real value. Prayer, therefore, is a means whereby we participate in God's efficacious work. And prayer impacts our attitude toward God. And God always gives what we need, but he doesn't always give what we ask for. And, and just as a side note, something not in my notes, you, if you read Andrew Murray's book on prayer, he talks about how in prayer we enter into the divine counsel of the Holy Trinity, which exists outside of time. And so our prayers are viewed by God from outside of time and therefore are incorporated into his providential plan for how the universe unfolds. And so our prayers do have true meaning and significance and impact. But what about providence then and miracles? Miracles are those special supernatural works of God which are not explicable on the basis of the usual patterns of nature, says Erickson. And this brings up the issue of miracles and natural law. Those who believe that miracles do not occur believe the universe is a closed universe. And if there is a God, uh, he can't be involved in it. Uh, and so some people will argue that miracles are simply manifestations of little known natural laws. Those who believe in miracles uh, may say that miracles are a breaking of natural law. Others may say that miracles counter natural forces with supernatural forces. This would be more akin to the, uh, the biblical idea that miracles counter natural forces with supernatural forces. So what is the purpose of miracles? Why, why would God do these things? Well, first of all, God does whatever he does. He does to glorify himself. 
So they are first and foremost, they are to glorify God. Secondly, in the Bible, we see miracles are a means that God uses to establish the supernatural basis of his revelation. When God sent Moses into Egypt, he sent him with miracles to prove the veracity of what he said, his message and his mission. When God sent Jesus, he came performing miracles to prove and establish who he was. When the apostles went out preaching the gospel initially, God confirmed their words with miraculous signs. So they, they established the basis of revelation. And thirdly, God gives miracles to meet human needs. Sometimes we have needs that cannot be met any other way. And God uses miracles to meet human needs.